In the time that we have, we would like to relate to you our story. It is our life, our experience. Our intent in this session is not to provide the doctrinal support for our position. We want to leave that to the experts. And within CBE, there's quite a wealth of information on that topic. We merely intend to relate how our lives have been impacted practically as a result of a change in our theological position of marriage based upon our own personal studies of the issues regarding hierarchical and egalitarian positions. You know, we looked at a drama not too long ago that took quite a comical view, um, but it illustrated a very important point, and that is that perspective matters, doesn't it? Makes all the difference in the world. Her perspective was so different than his perspective, and reality wasn't either of them. But uh, our perspective going into marriage made all the difference in the world in terms of how we experienced life for the first 10 years that we related one to another, first you know, in dating and then in our first era or uh, chapter of marriage. And uh, what we want to do to help illustrate this transformation that we went through is we want to just start out by giving you a little bit of background of where we came from. And so I'll start out. Uh, grew up in a Christian home, lived in 11 different countries, grew up moving from one place to another. And uh, throughout my life, I remember thinking, you know, I would love to do some wonderful things in this life. I'd love to do some great things for God even. Came to Christ at an early age and was a, in a very nurturing family. And all along, I was invested in, I was told I was a leader. I remember the first time that uh, I, first time I ever was told I was a leader is just remember walking in the yard with my brother and we were out playing. And then for some reason, he just stopped and he looked at me and he said, you know, Jimmy, you're a leader. And I remember thinking, well, that's interesting. But that was just symptomatic of what my life was like, of having people pour into me, believe in me, giving me opportunities. I remember even uh, as early as the first grade, having vision and aspiration for what my life could turn out to be. I remember on the playground running, and I was a little faster than the other kids. And I thought, you know, maybe someday I could go to the Olympics. And, uh, and God gave me that privilege. I was able to go 12 years ago in Seoul, South Korea. And, and all along, I had people like coaches saying, you know, you can do this. You can go to the Olympics. There were no limitations on, on a sense of um, what I thought my life could be like and what I could do with it. Um, even in the fourth grade, I remember having a sleepover with a friend who was a missionary kid. And both of us in the fourth grade dreamed of how we could give ourselves vocationally to ministry when we grew up. I remember just in my family and in church culture being taught that, that man was to be kind of the loving head of the household. You know, I was taught that men and women were, were equal in the eyes of God, but that he ordained loving roles for men and different roles for women. And that if we submitted to those roles, both of us would be very fulfilled. Now, I grew up in a home where the father and the mother, you know, my father and mother, tended to have been gifted and temperamentally and gifted, gift-wise, that more matched those roles that were laid out. So to me, I thought that was normative. The reason why we had a happy family was because these roles were being fulfilled. And, um, and so this kind of, kind of man as the leader, the wife as the follower, was just kind of, wasn't really strongly stated, it was just kind of understood in the culture that that's just the way it was. So I took that right into marriage. You know, I felt like, you know, I would provide for Leanne, I would serve Leanne, I would resource her. But clearly it was in the context as she followed my leadership and submitted to my leadership. Now, oddly enough, even as a little kid, I remember feeling a little uncomfortable about some inconsistencies with that. Um, we would talk about women couldn't do this, but then women missionaries did that. And we all applauded. <laughs> And I thought, now that's odd. <laughs> and then no one seemed to ever really be able to put their finger on exactly what being head really meant in a practical way. And what I noticed as, you know, I listened to kind of Greg and Bob talk about, I, I, I saw a lot of the more mature couples say they were under this kind of headship hierarchical model, but it didn't seem to me they behaved that way. <laughs> seemed to me it was more mutual in how they made their decisions. And then I had this haunting thought that never left me as a kid. I remember thinking when I got a lay of the land of church life and home life, I remember thinking, Whew, 
boy, am I glad I'm a boy. <laughs> well, I too was a leader. Uh, but unlike Jimmy, my, my, my life folded, unfolded a little differently. Uh, my leadership positions that I took on was primarily in the school uh, and sometimes within the church uh, as long as that coincided with um, the church's view or where women could serve. I uh, was born into a Christian home and raised and uh, accepted Christ at an early age and in my early teens um, began to develop a deep commitment to God and really wanting to do what he wanted me to do. Uh, However, the subtleties of my environment began to shape me in a different way. Religion was intrinsic in the culture, as was male dominance. I grew up in a strong Bible-believing church in the South, and both inside and outside the church, this became a prevailing factor. And both of these aspects, uh, the religion in the culture and the male dominance in the culture, seemed to kind of just, one justified the other, and it kind of blurred the lines between what really was God saying and what was my culture saying to me, just like the panelists were talking about before. This became my religious, my theological perspective on how life should be lived. I thought this perspective was right, and the way it was supposed to be, the way that God had ordained it to be. And I began to perceive that there was an ideal of what a godly Christian woman should be. Quiet, introverted, with gifts of helps and hospitality and mercy, much like Jimmy's mother was gifted. And much like most of the women that I had seen in my church, the role models there in the church. And I saw my role as a godly woman to marry a man with vision and calling and a deep commitment to God. And I would support him in his endeavors and he would protect me and provide for me and our family. Because I had seen this model many times in my church and through many godly women. This was held as an ideal with high esteem. My deepening commitment to God naturally resulted in my desiring to become this type of person. I had been an outgoing, athletic, um, academic, uh, academically driven student. But as I grew in what I perceived my commitment to God to be, I began to see some of those aspects, the aspects of leadership, the aspects of being outgoing, as evils that needed to be overcome. I knew I needed to change in order to become that. I began to suppress these qualities and take on the new ones, thinking that this was maturing. I attempted to fit myself into this new mold. And it was around this time that Jimmy and I started dating. Boy, we just fit together at that point. <laughs> she was wanting to be what I thought was normal and ought to be. And we dated for four years. And the tragedy of, of this is that this is happening in churches all the time. And you know what we were called? We were called leaders. We were called the example. We were patted on the back. If there was ever a young Christian couple to emulate, it was us. And I looked at all the changes that she was going through, and I defined that as spiritual growth. Though she was becoming something altogether different than what God created her to be. My family and some close friends uh, noticed the changes, and some would attempt to express concerns at times. And since we were so well respected within our, our religious realm, their objectives, their objections seemed hardly justifiable. Yeah. We married and continued to be examples in the church, Sunday school teachers, leaders in the church. What a nice young Christian couple. Boy, they're getting it right. And uh, in our, but what would happen though along the way I think all of us struggle to want to discover life, don't we? We want to experience and engage in life fully. And there was this thing inside of Leanne crying out, this is not life-giving for me. And so every once in a while, her leadership would try to slip out and would. <laughs> and, you know, 
her normal nature that had been kind of was tr she was trying to suppress and I was championing that suppression was 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 not to be denied and it would slip out and I remember in sometimes in insignificant ways we'd be heading somewhere and we both knew where that place was and I would pick a certain way to go and she would say well you know why don't we go another way and I remember thinking you know I'm a pretty competent guy I know how to get from point A to point B can you just like trust me here I mean, what difference does it make that we go this way or that way? And I do think my way is faster. Uh, <laughs> you know, other times it would, it would reveal itself in not so insignificant ways, like where we would go to church. We were involved in a church that was killing her, but I had responsibilities. I was a leader. I was like... There were a lot of people that depended on me to minister to them, to lead them. I mean, get yourself together because we got to do this thing. And, and since I make the final call here, you know, you know, we got to stay. Um, and then uh, in the midst of all of this, I started training for the Olympic Games. That opportunity came up. I'd been training a long time, but, you know, when we got married, I said, Lee, two years and and we got to prioritize going to the Olympics, you know, where I don't think we can get married. It was kind of like a, uh, a conditional thing, which, you know, we were, I mean, I heard all the pre-counseling stuff and don't do that kind of stuff, but, you know, I had wanted to go to the Olympics, so I made it a, a deal. You know, we've, we've got to train for the Olympics and prioritize that. Well, Jimmy met all the expectations that I had for a godly man. His lifelong desire to compete in the Olympics certainly provided a great opportunity for me to help him in whatever way I could. He asked for two years to train for the Olympics and I couldn't deny that. I assisted him in his after work training which filled our evenings. My days were filled with various domestic endeavors and I had no goals or ambitions of my own other than helping Jimmy out and working toward his. I thought this was the way it was supposed to be. He placed fourth in the 1987 Pan American Games for the country of his birth, El Salvador. This opened the door for the Olympics in 1988. As the training increased, I took a high school teaching position to support us while Jimmy trained full time. I found myself becoming absorbed into the details of his dream and finding my purpose to be through him. I believe this was the way that it should be. However, I knew something wasn't quite right, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I kept telling myself I wasn't praying enough or that I had some unconfessed sin that I needed to get right. I felt like the answer was that we needed to start a family. A baby would help fill the void. <laughs> I was six and a half months pregnant when we went to Seoul for the 1988 Olympics. And it was really right after the Olympics that I sensed and got a window for the first time that maybe something was very wrong in our relating patterns. Um, we had just finished the Olympics and I had done respectably. I had had some injuries and so it was quite a, a feat to, to get there and not get hurt and score respectably. But afterwards I thought, oh my, well I could do way better in this event and I could improve in that event and this event. What if I trained four more years? think of what could happen. And we were on a train outside of Seoul, traveling, and my dad and my mom and Leanne and I were on this train, and I was talking to my dad. And I said, oh, dad, you know, I could get better at this event, and I could get better at that event, and if I improve these points, if I train four more years, I think I could do this. And then out of the corner of my eye, I saw Leanne. And there was this look of horror on her face. It wasn't angry, it wasn't mad, it wasn't, she was speechless. It was just as if I could look into her soul. It's like God allowed a little window to be opened in her heart for me to look in her soul, to hear her cry out without words, Jimmy, if you do this thing, I don't think I'm going to make it. And then I remember just um, quickly kind of stopping the conversation with my dad. And I just started to think about that a little bit. And then I remember and I said, well, you know, Jim, you know, a deal's a deal. And you said two years, and she did the two years, so we're done. So I quietly closed that chapter of my life. 
And, uh, but just six months later, <laughs> I found yet another expression that we didn't have a deal on, and that was the Harvard Business School. <laughs> and about six months later, I got a letter of acceptance to Harvard saying to go. Another once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. In fact, when she was giving birth, I was filling out the application in the delivery room <laughs> while we were... <laughs> I did While put I it away working. at the key point. <laughs> so, we went to, so we went to Harvard, packed our bags, moved to Boston, and I started the MBA there. Well, ironically, I was excited about the opportunity. Well, it was something new and something different. What I didn't see, what it, that it was the same song, different verse. It didn't take long for the newness of the baby or the transition to Harvard to wear off. The emptiness returned. I couldn't understand what that was about. I was doing what I thought God had ordained for me to do. We continued to be highly respected as a Christian couple, but the emptiness turned into hopelessness and the hopelessness into depression. How could I be living out the life of an ideal godly woman and feel this way? I remember looking in the mirror and not having a clue as to who I was or what I wanted. Our second child was born during, during this time, and my life had reached the bottom. Many nights I would pray telling God that if this was the best that he had for me, and I believed that, he, that it was, that I'd rather just go on to be with him. Could he just take me in my sleep? Well, when I realized that this wasn't going to happen, obviously didn't, <laughs> I began to take on a methodical, a methodical existence. I believe a sort of survival mode kicked in. I was doing the bare minimum to raise our two children and not much more. But no one would have been able to tell from the outside. We maintained our image very well. And the whole time, you know, everyone's thinking we're this wonderful couple and, you know, we're going home and, and she's this depressed woman. And I'm thinking, man, what is wrong with her? What is the problem? How come she can't get her life together? And then, you know, I'm, I'm always wanting to be on the solution side of things, so what, what can be fixed here? Let's figure out what's wrong with you and, and you know, try to fix her. And... Uh, <laughs> I just couldn't understand how life could get all so screwed up with such well-meaning intentions. I wasn't a bad guy, you know. Um, I felt like I was, you know, doing pretty good for us and, and our family and our future. And, and, uh, and then God brought something into our lives. I'm at the Harvard Business School and a Jewish non-Christian professor comes up to me and he says, I heard you know about this place called Willow Creek Community Church. I said, well, yeah, I visited there. And he said, I want to write a case study on that church and include it in the Harvard Business School curriculum. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. are we at the Divinity School? I thought I was in the business school. What do you mean a church? He said, yeah, Peter Drucker thinks a lot about this church and thinks that a lot of companies could learn from it. Learn from their leadership, learn from their vision, learn from their strategy. And there's some things that, that you know, I think nonprofits, churches included, could teach companies. Okay. Well, and he said, would you write it? And I said, well, sure. <laughs> All right. So he sent me to Willow, and I start, studied the church, and I came across this interesting program. I found out that that church desired to organize their whole ministry around spiritual gifts. Not around gender, not around race, not around particular roles for certain groups of people, but around spiritual gifts. It was a program called Network. And when Jimmy brought home Network, um, it was a spiritual gift, gift assessment tool that obviously that they used there at Willow Creek. And for whatever reason, I decided to study the materials on my own. And you know, it wasn't long into the study that I noticed that there were no gender specifications. If my gender didn't dictate my gift mix, then could I possibly be responsible for discovering and developing my giftedness on my own? 
thoughts of my childhood leadership involvement came to mind and I remember thinking, could that be a possibility? What about the gender issues involving women in leadership in the church? There were so many questions that I had. Not long after completing the study, I came to Willow Creek uh, Church Leadership Conference with Jimmy, and I sat in on a session given by Ben Hybels, who was the senior pastor's wife. It was entitled, I Died to Self and Myself Almost Died. <laughs> I couldn't believe the honesty, the openness, and the vulnerability with which she spoke about very difficult issues in her own life and in her marriage. She gave a, rec a recommended reading list and I copied them all down. In the next few months, I began to unpack some very deep-rooted issues that I never knew existed. This was the beginning of my journey to wholeness. It was as if God were speaking to me directly through the books that I was reading. I read of topics like codependency and recovery and understanding my personality and temperament and the implications of that on my life and on the others around me. It didn't end there. This uncovered issues of women in leadership in the church and male dominance, and the questions began, get, began to form as to, were there any other views of marriage other than the ones that I was taught? Could these views be substantiated by interpretations based on a high view of scripture? Around this time, Jimmy took on the position at the Willow Creek Association. It wasn't long after that that I crossed paths with Gilbert Bilizekian and his book, Beyond Sex Roles. He introduced me to CBE, and I was introduced to the wealth of information that supports this egalitarian position that I had never heard of. Well, it was quite interesting after our background <laughs> to see this woman all of a sudden filled with passion, filled with light, filled with energy, not laying around, you know, depressed, wanting to read, wanting to learn, wanting to grow. And, I mean, there was a part of that was very attractive, but kind of threatening. And I'm like, where is this going? You're about to dismantle. I mean, my, it's like, it, my, that system worked for my family. It would have worked for us if you'd have played ball. I mean, what's going on? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then I began to realize I had a choice to make. I had power in this situation. I could have shut her down. I could have manipulated. I could have worked it so that this discovery process would get cut off. And I didn't know where it was going to end up. I just had to, I finally had to just look at myself and realize if I did that, there was something very, very, very wrong about doing that. You know, up here, I can't remember who was it that said it up here, but the theology of being a Christian person is so supersedes the theology of, or it, it completely encompasses this theology of marriage. And God did live in my heart. And then he gave me a little second window. And he, this time, it wasn't a window into her heart. It was a window into my heart. And though I had lived life rightly, I'd never lived a, a, a part of my life where I outwardly rebelled against God. There was never error in my life. I was always a, a young Christian, well-respected throughout my life. So I wasn't really in tune or in touch with my depravity like I needed to be. I'd lived life rightly. And so he opened a little window and he let me see my ugliness and he let me see my depravity at a level I'd never seen it before and he let me see the impact of that on the life of the person I said I loved the most and it crushed me. It's been so many years now I still can't talk about it without feeling the depth of of what it meant to me in that moment. It just crushed me, and believe me, I needed some crushing. And um, I remember thinking, I don't know where this is gonna go, but I think you're in it, God. And if it means 
if it means dismantling and throwing away our whole pattern of relating, I'm willing to do that because I figure the only reason I wouldn't do that is because I'm an insecure person and I, I don't want that to be the reason why we wouldn't let this discovery process go along and go from there. So it's been almost 10 years now since we... Uh, Hit bottom. Yeah. <laughs> Good word for it. <laughs> and um, that's what we did. We took our relating patterns in our system, my system, I'm sorry, my Am system. I? Yeah, well, you, yeah, I mean, you went along, I guess. <laughs> but we took that system and we found a garbage can and we put it in its proper place. And then we started from scratch, from nothing, a clean sheet of paper. Okay, so now what? <laughs> now what do we do? Who's the leader here? You always heard of that myth of the two-headed monster, you know? But you know what? That, those words have done more damage to hinder growth than any, than so many words. Because it sounds so right and it is so wrong. It is so wrong. What's the Godhead? So we began to discover community. True community. True intimacy. Where there's collaboration, where there's mutuality. And CBE was so helpful because it allowed her to do tremendous learning and then it allowed her to teach me. And um, we do decisions differently now. You know, we often do it by gifting. Well, who is more gifted in this area? Who has more experience in this area? We do it by negotiation. Um, we do it at times by agreed upon delegation that we both can support. Well, you know, just run with that. And, or we, we do it by where time and circumstances allow. We just wait until there's consensus. We go round one, no consensus. Round two, no consensus. Round three, you know, the hammering it out, well, okay, we can identify with those words. <laughs> round four, round five. And as long as there isn't a time situation or circumstances allowed, we just let that go until there's consensus. It's hard work. It's messy. It's rough. You know, it, but I'll tell you, it's right. And it's fulfilling. And, and to see Leanne filled with life and vision and energy for life, for her life, for our life, for our marriage, for our family. I wouldn't, whatever we had in the past that looked so neat and tidy and orderly in our system, oh my goodness. I look at that and the word I put on that is tragedy. That's the word I label on our first 10 years of relating, four of marriage, six of, uh, four of dating, six of marriage. Well, this is a new chapter in our lives, and it's brought a new season. All my studies and academic growth that I did uh, close to 10 years ago, or started to do then, led me to the place that this fall I began uh, my Master of Divinity program at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. I don't know where it's going to take me. God hasn't revealed that to me at this point, but I do know that I'm just so hungry to learn and hungry to, to grow and to grow in the knowledge and understanding of what God has said, not rely on what other people can teach me about that, but that I myself can go to the original language, can go and do my own study on that. And that has been a wonderful thing for me. I've got a long way to go, but just even the beginning. And even in the midst of that, trying to figure out the details. You know, I've got 730 classes that start in Deerfield and I live 27 miles away. So Jimmy is the one that gets the kids up in the morning, cooks some breakfast, sits them down, has a little devotional with them. And it's, I've been able, a couple of days that, that I've stayed home, uh, not had class, and I, to witness that, it fills my heart to know that he is in, as involved as he is in the kids' lives. And you know, they don't see any difference in their parents. If what one holds, the other holds, and that, that there is no, there's no hierarchy. There's no, one person is, has more power or authority than the other. And it's just been a phenomenal thing to see. We can seamlessly 
go in and out of our scheduling and the kids don't even miss a beat if it's just one parent there or the other. It's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. I mean, they frequently see us negotiating together and, and having orderly, lively. <laughs> but you know what? I figure we're training them to learn how to work it out, to, we're tr how to hammer it out. To, that, you know, we do this thing, we do this thing together. I felt like I had been asleep so many years that I'd wasted. It's hard to read your notes when you... <laughs> <laughs> Through ministries like Willow Creek Community Church and Christians for Biblical Equality, I have found hope. I've found a different paradigm. I don't know what the future holds for me personally, but I do know now that I can hear God calling me specifically. And this is a miracle. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think why we're in the room is so important. I think that's why a ministry like CBE is so important. I think there are, I think our story could, repeat it, could be repeated thousands of times in this country. People living quiet lives of desperation, who feel stuck, but who feel like they're, they're doing it right. And so now what do we do? I mean, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I get to lead a ministry of some of the most outreach-oriented churches in this land. They're converting more than 10 times the average number of conversions per church in this country. And these church leaders are trying to pioneer new biblical patterns of church life and trying to bring renewal to the church. And one of the things that we've noticed is that there are a lot of things that ought to be normal in church life that aren't. And the way those things are going to become normal in church life is when churches take leadership of some of these issues and begin to show the way and begin to pave the way for some of these new expressions of, of appropriate biblical uh, patterns of church life, like true community. And so, whereas so many churches don't have a deep understanding and concept and expression of community, that ought to be normal in a church, don't you think? That ought to be normal in a church. And we want that to be normal. And that's why, you know, I hope you didn't let the announcement that, that Mimi said earlier about CBE now having church memberships. Friends, don't let that slip as just a small announcement. That is a huge announcement. Because churches can provide leadership to so many people that go to them. Churches can teach. Churches can train. Churches can lead. And if churches more and more will get in tune and in touch with the plethora of resources that, are, that CBE is organizing and making available for people, we can see church transformation. I'm seeing it happen on multiple fronts in the Willow Creek Association from 90 plus denominations. You can see church transformation happening one church at a time. And my hope, wouldn't it be something wouldn't it be something if someday it was normal in church life for churches to be organized around spiritual gifts? Normal in church life for a female senior pastor, a male senior pastor? That's just normal. What's the gift? Where's the passion? Where's the calling? And we follow God in that regard. Well, it ain't normal right now, but I'm very hopeful. They're very good signs. Just the other day, a few days some days ago, I saw a Gallup report come across my desk. I get those frequently. They asked a question in 1977, 23 years ago. Do you, to Christians, do you agree with women in the clergy? About 40% of men said yes. About 70% of women said yes. Do you know what that is today? Same for women. About 70% say yes, and they agree with that. About 70% of men, too, now. 23 years. So, you know, as we, you know, as please get behind the CBE ministry. Support it with your dues. Get your church. Don't let your pastor be denied and your church be denied these resources. Get your church to join. By the way, she didn't ask me to say this. This is coming. You know what? Because if our church, and it was similar church life, you know, I, 
she wouldn't have been asleep for 15 years, and we wouldn't have lived a, a, a tragedy. You know, we were well-meaning people who were led by our church incorrectly. So that's our story. Thanks so much for listening.